very nice. I like the red. It's a little bit far yes, apart. Yes, sure. Should we push a little bit? <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out. I'm, um, I'm Fred, a uh, partner with Creandum. We're an early stage venture fund in Europe. So offices in Stockholm, Berlin, London, and actually in California as well. I have the best job on the planet. I, uh, I get to team up at the first, first inception and, and slightly later stages with the best founders in Europe and beyond. So Creandum has backed companies like Spotify and Klarna and Trade Republic. And actually, one of the six companies that we invest in become worth a billion dollars or more. I'm going to use that statistic for as long as it is valid, just so you know. But one of those, one of those companies is one that we're going to talk about today. And I'm super happy to have Maria with me on stage. Um, uh, Maria built Depop, as you heard, and for those of you who, um, who need a memory refresh, Depop is a vintage fashion and apparel marketplace predominantly used by Gen Z. And by the time we worked together, the company was tracking past the billion dollars of GMV. So started in Italy, you know, grown up in the UK under Maria's leadership, and actually Maria's build out of the organization and the culture merits its own stage time. But we won't talk about that today. So we're going to talk about the M&A process and the selling of, of your business. So um, really welcome, Maria. And uh, maybe you want to start by taking us back to 2021 when, uh, when things got started. Well, thanks, first and foremost. Um, I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Uh, but let's just make this clear, this was a team effort and you were part of it. So I hope you give me the liberty to ask you some questions as well. I know you ask about 2021, but I think it would be good that I take you back to 2016 when I became CEO after two years in the business. So from 16 to 21, we had three very distinct chapters in the life of the company. So from 16 to 18, 18 to 20, and then 2021. So in the first phase, 16 to uh, 18, which by the way was a year after Creandum came on board, it was very much fighting for survival. I don't think you expected that a year after you came on board, but it was the case. Newly appointed CEO, three months of run rate, very high level of employee turnover, tech debt, you name it. So my sole focus was, okay, let's get the business out of this mess. In 2018, 2020, we managed to get some sort of stability within the team, within the platform, um, in the business in general, and we were aiming to reach this inflection point in the US where uh, we could really prove that the business was growing beyond its core markets. And we managed to get on the back of that one of the top tier private equity funds, General Atlantic, coming on board. And then the last chapter, 2020, 2021, was when COVID happened. And as for many of you, I suppose, at the beginning it was very challenging because it was not clear what direction it was going to take us. And then very quickly, it created this explosive growth. So it was very much about managing that growth, which again, by the way, it, um, it really, really uh, made that impact in the US and Etsy to notice and reach out later on. So I guess my key um, point here is throughout the process, I've always been very focused on taking the business to the next level with the view of creating a long lasting business quality business that would be relevant in the industry and would drive the impact that we wanted. And I was always very, very surprised when CEOs and founders would say things like, oh, you know, my sole goal is to take the company public, or, hey, I want to get to the unicorn status. I just couldn't relate to that. I think that's interesting. I think it was really uh, significant for, for how you built and run the company. You were focused on building a quality quality business that could stand on its own legs. And I think that was a, that was a hallmark of the, Depop, of the Depop story. And actually, entrepreneurs who have that mindset and who think less about valuation levels or think less about the IPO, I think are better off. 
we think IPO is IPO or being a public company is a perfect role model for the well, for the rigor with which you need to build your business and be able to articulate what it is that you do. The public market is a very strong judge of that. And if you're, if you're taking your company towards being able to IPO, you're building it in the right way. Focusing on it, however, is not the right thing, because just as any other funding event, that is what it is. And it brings a lot of other things, um, a lot of other things with it. Well, Let's, let's talk about M&A then. What, what, what happened? You mentioned that, uh, that Etsy uh, reached out. Was that, was that how the discussion started around, around selling the business? Yeah, so I've always tried to be connected in sort of the business circles. And so, you know, reaching out to key players, investors, competitors, you name it. And um, in fact, back in the days, I reached out to the CEO of Etsy, who completely ignore my email. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, but somehow down the line, um, someone from, from, from his team reached out because they were expanding in the UK and they wanted to have some sort of like knowledge sharing discussion. And I was like, sure. And we actually had a very good um, interaction with them. But then post COVID, he reached out and said something like, what are your plans? And up until that moment, we only received sort of mild uh, approaches. But I knew this one was some, uh, an approach that we really needed to lean in because I could really see the business learning and leapfrogging from uh, their experience, improving so many parts of our user journey of the business. And we also share lots of company and community values. So, so I was like, we definitely need to lean in. But I guess my message here is, I think it's important to be connected, but you have to find your right angle. If you just go into meeting people for the potential acquisition down the line, that's probably not a very good uh, way, because I really believe companies uh, should be bought, not sold. But, but so to the CEOs uh, in this audience and, and elsewhere, what, what is your advice on on interacting with people who could ultimately be the acquirers? What's the right level of engagement, the, the right level of, of interaction? Yeah, so I think you have to approach it in a very authentic way. You want to learn. I think big companies can learn from small companies in the same way as the, the opposite. So, yeah, just focus on, on that level of partnership. And it's interesting. So when you decided, because it sounded like you decided to sort of explore this, this mail from Josh in, in some more... Uh, in some more earnesty, what, it was basically because you felt it was, a, it was good for the business more than it was a liquidity event. Totally. Again, like I thought we could really learn from a business that had been through the same process that we had been five years, I mean, they'd been five years prior, so totally. I mean, this is very interesting, of course. I mean, for me, this, this, uh, this has another twist. Of course, as an investor, your job is to maximize the value of your investment. It just so happens that the companies who have that interest that you saw from Etsy, the, the companies that have that alignment, are the ones that can pay the most. Yeah. So, of course, it's also, it's also beneficial from that point of view. Totally. So, high level, talk us through the process. What, what was the process like with, mm. with Etsy and selling the business? So, I had a major misconception about the actual process because up until that moment, it was the only acquisition that I had been through. And my misconception was that I thought it was going to be some sort of like a fundraising process where you prepare your deck, you've got your list of investors, but actually in this case there was only one investor, so easier, you pitch, and then you go into due diligence. So all in all, like six months, no? Easy. I mean, easy. I know it was going to be hard, but like, I sort of could visualize what the process was going to be. And so then I went, to, I went to talk to the chair, Mark Evans, at that time. And I'm like, look, Mark, look this email. Let's, let, let's do this. And he's like, Maria, hold your horses. There is a process you need to follow. And it's basically, first and foremost, we need to ask the board if there's an appetite for this. And I was like, really? We need to ask for permission to do this? Of course, you know, they own the company. 
So, uh, okay, let's, let, let, let's do that. And then you have to appoint a bank. You have to get a, uh, a lawyer. Lawyers you do know because you do get them for a fundraise, but a, a bank to do what? And I'm like, okay, whatever. And then he says something like, and by the way, don't show your cards until the last moment or until I tell you so. Don't show your cards, as in yeah. don't show as what if, your view is. Yes. What, so as, what, 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 what was this about? Yeah, I was like, why? I mean, isn't it super important what I have to say about this process? Am I not a key decision maker in this? And, he's, and, and at the moment, I did not understand. But as the process went through, and I sort of saw how he built this sense of like, we're going to go step by step, we're going to understand whether this is good for the business, and we're going to make sure that keep, we keep everyone neutral. Because in the same way that you don't want to have a board where everybody's looking for their own interest, you want every single board member to be as neutral as possible. You also want the CEO to be as neutral as possible and make sure that they don't do it for their own interest. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. I'll keep my mouth shut. Um, and in the end, it was a very good strategy. Yeah, I think, I think this, is a, this is a very important point for... Um for everyone to think about when, when, because when money's on the table, like, like there is in an exit process, that sort of brings out, yeah, it brings out a lot of different emotions and also incentives. Like money's there, people want to go after it or not. And it sort of really, it really makes for a very pointy discussion. And typically it brings out um, the less good sides of people, for instance, on the board. And if you think about it, the job of the board of a company is to represent the shareholders. But very quickly, in M&A or exit processes, the discussion becomes, no, I, Creandum, I don't like this deal because of X. I only make 20 times the money. And for the record, Depop returned one times our fund and you know, 25 times our money, so all good. My point is, the, the, the thing that Mark did was that he put the right context around this. He knew that if you were to start by saying, I want this, the next thing would be everyone else were, were, was going to start thinking about what, what do I want. Totally. And so it's, it's the right, it's sort of framing it in the right way. Let's do what's best for the business. Let's make sure that we're fiduciaries for the shareholders and the board and, and make sure that we take the right decisions by everyone. I think it, I think it really played out well. Totally. And I guess one of my key messages for you all is make sure you build a very strong board. Of course, it's not easy and it takes time. Up until that moment, 2021, 20, well, the process started in 2020, um, I had worked on building the board for like four years. Probably it was because, yeah, I became CEO and that was the first place I look as to like, let's get a board that supports me and helps me through this process. But to, when we got to 2021, 20, at that point, we had a very experienced, very established, and quite balanced board. And when you say balanced, what, what does that mean? We, we had a good percentage of investors versus operators versus people from the company. And it was instrumental to have, to have them. And in fact, there was one occasion where I think they did an amazing job, and I wonder whether you can't talk about it, which is the price leverage that you built yeah, I mean, let, let's talk about that, uh, that quickly. So the, the idea for any exit process is to maximize the value, like making sure that you get paid the most you can. I mean, that is, the, that is actually the responsibility towards the shareholders. The problem in this case was that there was only really one buyer, right? So, so well, there was one interested buyer. And best practice is to make sure that you at least have two, so you get the best, the best price. In this case, I think we, we had the advantage of no investor really wanting to sell. Everyone, everyone was seeing the business developing super well. So there was that, and I think we managed to equip you with, yeah. with that kind of sentiment. What, was that, is that your totally. impression as well? Totally. I think you guys did an amazing job. And so there was, from the point of view of the buyer, I think there was a real view that this company doesn't have to sell. So that's like first... first baseline, create optionality, and make sure that the buyer understands that you don't have to do this transaction. That could, that could take different shapes and forms. But then to, to really negotiate price, this was, this was a slightly more intricate exercise for us. Um, you can do it differently. In this case, we were faced by a very big buyer. 
with a really good investment bank on their side. So what we had to do was we had to spin up our own realistic alternative for what liquidity for the shareholders could look like in the case of Depop. So we built out our own IPO scenario and sort of fast forward the company two years until it was ready for an IPO. And then we used the valuation that we thought we could get at that point as the anchor for the price negotiations. And because we had a lot of optionality, no one really needed to sell. And because we had this price, we actually managed to get an incredible deal together. Yeah. Totally. Well done. <laughs> well, it was, it, was all, it was all your credit. Um, let's talk about... Uh, let's talk about bankers and advisors and lawyers. What, what is your view on... Yeah, so I did mention that at the beginning I didn't think um, we needed a bank, but in hindsight, it was extremely important. So first, they are coming with a breadth of knowledge from so many transactions that they've been through, which is extremely valuable. Then they are supposed to be neutral and provide you a very good view as to what if you go for the IPO route, this is what you're getting. If you go for the strategy, this is what you're getting. And then last, and probably the most important thing is, because it was a public company, we had to keep everything extremely confidential, which had a positive side, which was that I was able to keep my team um, not involved in it and obviously less distracted by it. The only person that I could confide um, was the CFO, who was absolutely instrumental in the transaction, François Calin, who, by the way, had joined in 19, so I got to know him extremely well through this process. It becomes like sort of your best friend. And, and yeah, and so when you think about the amount of materials that need to be produced, yeah. the modeling behind it, if it's just the two of us, it would have been incredibly difficult to, to do. So they, they really, really, they were very valuable. Um, and I, think, I think that's a good point. I mean, in general, if you have a process with more interested parties, bankers are exceptionally useful because they can play them off against each other. But even, even in our case, where just the support that you got and, and the modeling support and the, and the offloading of work was, was, was valuable. Was really valuable. And then uh, lawyers, I always say this, don't be cheap with lawyers because it can get extremely technical and you don't have the time to get into the nitty-gritties. And they can also negotiate very well on your behalf. And so in the context where many of these processes fail, you want to be as focused in the business as possible. And if you surround yourself by great advisor, you are able to do so. Let's, um, let's talk a bit about that last thing you said, which is many processes fail. Like most of the M&A processes that are started or hinted at they never conclude. Exactly. So I had a very good vaccine, a vaccine? for this. A vaccine, yeah. So again, Mark Evans, the, 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 the chair, told me at the very beginning, Maria, don't worry. It's very unlikely that this transaction is going to happen because in my, from, you know, my career, having done lots of M&A, I can guarantee you that transactions don't happen unless the CEOs meet each other face to face. And we were in the middle of COVID, so I'm like, there's no way I'm going to meet this guy. <laughs> and so you thought there was just no way the deal was going to happen for us. Exactly. So my, my hopes were, I mean, of course, you want to have your hopes up, but I always had in the back of my mind that it was a high probability that this deal was not going to happen. But, uh, but, but yeah, it did. And so you, you, were, you were vaccinated in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> was, there, was there a particular um, make or break moment in, in, in the process that you, that you want to call out? I think many, many processes have at least one, oftentimes many, where you think the likelihood of it completing is like 1%. Yeah, was there, there were no, a, notable lo ones? a lot of moments where I'm like, okay, this is it. They're not going to go through this. Um, they are not going to allow this. Um, but there was a very particular moment towards the end when I was literally in the taxi on my way to the office on the last day half an hour before I was going to send the email to the entire company, letting them know that the company was going to be acquired, I get a phone call from the there was, lawyer. There was also an article, right? And, and exactly. And so the, the, it had to be sent at that particular time because five or ten minutes later, the FT article about the acquisition was going to go live. And so I get this call from one of the investors saying that they didn't want to sign. And I'm like, well, why? It was, had nothing to do with the price, with the details about the transaction. It was just basically himself exercise, exercising power at that stage. Was it blackmail? 
total blackmail. And I talked to the lawyer, I'm like, have you heard about something like this? And again, in my 20 years of experience, I've never experienced an investor doing this at the last hour. And so finally, we find a way, he signed, I pressed the button, and it was done. Cool, yeah, well done. But actually, I wonder, did you have any, any moments where you sort of like, your confidence fluctuates in terms of like whether the, the deal was going to go? Or? Oh, so this is special, and I think it's also useful for, for, uh, for the audience to know. Like when, when an investor is on the board or involved with a company, that really takes off. You don't want to sell. Mm. You never want to sell. You just want to ride it until it becomes bigger and bigger. Um, that's the instinct. That's, that's the profile of, of our business. So I was really, not, I was really not, not worried at all. I mean, the worst that could happen in my book was that it wouldn't hap the deal wouldn't happen, and then we'd, we'd go on and build an amazing business. But, but there was actually, there was actually a <laughs> a point in time, very late in the process, where that changed. It was this last board meeting. Yeah. Uh, you remember when we had to make the, we had to make the call. So I, I always felt that, you know, the alternative is just that we, we build this business, we take it public. And then we were in this board meeting where, yeah, can you, can you tell us? Yeah, so I remember that moment extremely well because it's probably the most emotional moment in my entire career. And it was the moment where, as I told you earlier, Mark told me, okay, this is the moment where you can show your cards. You can show your cards. I can, I can show my cards. And it was the moment where he said, okay, I mean, it had been quite a long time since that first email that I received, right? And we have done all the different steps that I was told we were going to go through. And it's the f we got the prize we wanted, and we get to this board meeting where everybody has to openly say what they want. And so as you guys were going through, I'm like, shit. What did we say? It's like, I, I mean, it was a bit like, it just felt like it was not going to happen, that more and more you guys wanted to continue. And it got to my turn, and I'm like, I was, it had this feeling of like frustration, tiredness, anger. And I was like, OK, uh, if I am very angry and start screaming, it's not going to be constructive, so let's breathe in. And I just felt. I had to say what I had inside. And I, I was like, first, yes, I'm not the CEO of this company, but by that time, I had been in the company for seven years. And I have hired pretty much everyone. So I really felt that I was like the founder. And I'm like, I do really feel that I have the interest of this company and this team I, in my heart. And second, and I did not want to put this dilemma out there on the table in the last hour. But I had to. I was like, I just don't think, if you want to take the company public, that I'm the right person to do so. And also, I just don't feel like I want to do this. So if you want to go and continue, you have to find another CEO. And when I say that, I'm like, I cannot believe I just said this. And then mic drop. <laughs> that was a it was a mic drop moment, for sure. And, I, uh, and that sort of shifted the minds of everyone in the room, because, I mean, the alternative scenario then didn't look as attractive anymore. And also, quite frankly, respectful of your taking care of the business and knowing what was best for it. I think everyone basically flipped at that, at that point, and the decision was Let's to go pursue for it. it. But the backstory is also, of course, that what, some of the work of the, of the board is also to make sure that the CEO doesn't sell out too quickly. But at this point, exactly. you know, we had pushed it more than, more than far enough. And so, yeah, so we, we concluded. Good. Um, I want to ask you, uh, as we wrap up here, what was the sentiment when things were done? When, when you know, when, when, when the deal was done and the papers were signed, like, how, how did that feel? Yeah, so it was quite surprising, because you expect to be extremely euphoric, super happy about the outcome. And I just had this emptiness. And I'm like, all this work to feel like this? And I remember one of those talks that I went to uh, of this like, very famous explorer that had climbed the Everest. Not, I mean, I think it's much more challenging to do that as a, as a company, but he's like, I reached the, the peak, and then I felt, OK, what's next? And I had this moment of like, I mean, this what's next moment, I still have it and it's been two years since I left the company, so it's definitely a journey where you expect to feel euphoric, happy, and it's, it's a mixed feeling. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it's really not what you expect. I mean, I'm not saying that it was not an amazing outcome and I'm not happy. Of course not. It's, it's great. It's great for us. We get to work with you. You're uh, spending uh, yeah, exactly. your adventure part with us. Now, so that's, that's, that's very happy. Should we try to sum up the sure. advice? Uh, the advice from, um, from you know, running a successful exit process, it starts with actually, I would say, running a resilient, independent, high caliber business. You did that super well as well. Exactly. One. Then build a great board uh, that supports you, that you trust, that they trust you, get amazing advisors. And then lastly, be patient. It's freaking roller coaster. Yeah, it's a roller coaster. Maria, thanks so much for speaking about this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.